everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for coming today. My name is Britt Royer, and I'm the curator here at St. Mary's College Museum of Art. Before we get started this evening, I would like to thank our colleagues in the communication department, Ellen and Lori, and also to thank our co-sponsoring um, through the Roy E. and Patricia Disney Forum. Um, a huge thanks to IT today for their help preparing and setting everything up, and to my team at the museum, John, Tara, and our MOA student assistants helping tonight, Kate, AJ, and Isabel. Um, and then a special thanks to our guest speakers, Zach and Rebecca. So, before we dive into the content of tonight's discussion, I do want to do a few housekeeping museum here and there things. Um, show of hands, who has been to the museum before? Okay, good. <laughs> so, for those of you who haven't, we're just located straight across the street from the Soda Center. Our typical hours are Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tonight, we're keeping the galleries open a little later till 7 p.m., so if you want to come and take a look at some of the artwork that we were referring to and dive into that, please do. Um, a few programs we do have coming up, one that might be of particular interest to our students here, um, we have Study Salon. So for those of you who haven't attended Study Salon before, it is a student-led space. We have student workers that run the front desk. Um, tables, snacks, beverages, you can just hang out and study during the finals. And those dates are going to be December 4th, 5th, and 6th, 4 to 10 p.m. Um, a new program we've started this fall is Cello in the Galleries, and we'll have a few uh, of those programs in early December as well. And then the last program I want to highlight is a family day we are actually doing on Saturday, December 3rd at 1 p.m. Um, and that is with Everett Lewis, who's a professor over in KSOE. Um, it will be a holiday light box shadow making activity. Okay, so um, at this time, I would like to introduce our guest today. So right next to me is Zach Clark. Um, Zach Clark is an Oakland-based artist, educator, and publisher. He received his BFA from University of Illinois, Chicago, and MFA from University of California, Davis. His work is rooted in locational memory and is based in the intersection of printmaking, photography, writing, and publication. He publishes as National Monument Press, a publishing project focused on supporting uniquely American stories through small edition prints and curatorial projects completed largely through collaboration with other artists. He is one half of Shoot Studio, an East Bay East Bay Rizzo Studio. He currently teaches design at California State University East Bay and has shown work, taught, um, and is in the collections across North America. Over here we have Rebecca Anchorman. She's a writer, designer, and artist based in San Francisco. Her essays on art, humanity, and tech have appeared in MIT Tech Review, The New York Times, Literary Hub, and other outlets. As a designer, she has worked on AI and ED tech for Google, financial literacy tools for NerdWallet, and built websites for places like the LA Times and Interview Magazine. Her tiny food sculptures have been shown in tiny galleries across the country, and she holds a BA from Brown University and an MFA in design from Pratt. Both Rebecca and Zach currently have work on display in the exhibition, Bake It Till You Make It, A Quest for Authenticity. Um, pictured here on our slides are actually Rebecca and Zach from our opening back in September, and so you can get an inside view of them seeing their work in the galleries. Um, today we're going to be diving into what authenticity means, and specifically how it impacts their practices, and how this might be perceived across different occupations and times, specifically in relation to art trends, reproduction of images, and today's art world. Before we dive into this meaty conversation, I do want us to spend a few moments really thinking about what authenticity is. Um, we live in a culture that really values authenticity, but how do we define it? Um, what are the markers of authenticity? So I'm going to kind of set the stage by talking about our curator my curatorial approach to the exhibition, Big It Till You Make It, A Quest for Authenticity. 
And this exhibition really pulls from objects in our permanent collection and invites visitors to consider these works through the angle of authenticity. How is art created, defined, and valued by artists and the societies in which they live? And then looking at this through a variety of different media. So we have paintings, photography, advances in printmaking, material exploration, and with all of these medias, the idea is the exhibition looks at this as individual case studies, demonstrating how authenticity exists in different senses that contract and expand in response to the ever-changing resources, perspectives, and cultural shifts. So, as I mentioned a little bit ago, there's a high value placed in authenticity, right? It's not just placed in the art world, but in how our Western cultures perceive and integrate it. Um, but in regards to art, how can authenticity be marked or regulated? Um, some of the questions I had through this curatorial process were this concept of how is fake defined in um, relation to authentic? How does the value of artist and object intent impact how authenticity is designated? How has the place and experience of work impacted or shifted the authenticity? Can a work of art be original if there are multiples? Do, do multiples and reproductions devalue authenticity? So much of this exhibition... <laughs> gotta wait, we gotta wait. <laughs> If you see some like nostrils flaring over here, it means that we're already on a good, good start to the evening. I am a uh, facially expressive <laughs> processor, so. Um, so much of this exhibition was informed by the theories and writings of Walter, Man, uh, Walter Benjamin's 1936 essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. And I pulled this quote right here because it's actually a part of the exhibition design. So it's the first thing that you see when you walk in. Um, the authenticity of a thing is the essence of all that is transmissible from its beginning, ranging from its substantive duration to its testimony to the history which it has experienced. I think one of the really interesting things about this quote is it's taken from the perspective of the object and not necessarily from the person receiving it. And so I think that's something for us to consider as we move through and we think about art, is we all have our own perceptions of how we view it through our experiences and our culture. Well, what does it look like knowing that we only know this object in a very small portion of its existence? So that's a lot to kind of nibble on and to sit with and to think about. Um, so we're going to ground it and ground authenticity in a few markers and senses to kind of give us the, the beginning. So some of these markers to think about authenticity is through taste and aesthetics. And this is something that we see a lot in like art history, um, also in terms of the art world today. Another item that's really important is provenance or nominal authenticity. So the idea of the correct identification of the object. Um, this idea that we understand a recorded ownership of this object and how it connects to its history and that we need to understand where this object has been through time to help us define the terms in which it was created. Another um, sense or marker could be artist intent. Um, the big difference between a forgery and a copy is a forgery is created with this intent to deceive. So when we don't know about an object, when we just received it, how can we say for certain it was designed to deceive us, even though it might deceive historians with how they currently approach it? Another marker we can think about is scarcity. With art, the idea is that there's limited amounts. Um, this was something that was very easy for us to think about in terms of earlier medias um, in Western art, thinking about oil paintings, right? Um, there's one. But how does this shift and change when you have multiples, when you have prints? Um, how do you balance and create these markers to create, create value? And then the last one is aura. And this kind of dives into this larger deep authenticity. There's a lot of different ideas of how we can define aura. And we'll dig a little bit deeper into this as we carry on this conversation, thinking about how Walter Benjamin defined it, but then also how aura is being defined now by how we live in it. 
So now that I've set the stage of thinking through a lot of these ideas about authenticity, I probably have given you way more information in theory than is grounded. We're going to switch over, and Zach is going to share a little bit about printmaking and their work, um, specifically their work in the exhibition. So, uh, well, it doesn't just have to be me, because, uh, yeah. but um, Rebecca and I made uh, these prints that you see on the screen over there and are also on show over in the gallery space, um, which we have loosely titled for letterpress posters uh, concerning trends in contemporary art. Um, it's an intentionally mouthful um, title. Um, that we made while on residence at a space in Petaluma called In Cahoots Residency. That is a printmaking and writer's residency um, run by the incredible Macy Chadwick. Um, yeah, so when we arrived, we knew we wanted to do something about NFTs. It was something that we were thinking a lot about. It was in the air, people were talking about it a lot. And at the time, which may be hard to remember because I think the tide has shifted a little bit since then, um, uh, people were really, really excited about them and there was very little criticism of it. So we, we had some ideas about how we wanted to talk about NFTs, non-fungible <laughs> tokens. You're looking at me like I should define it, non-fungible tokens. Um, which can take any kind of form, but, but a lot of them have been in the form of art um, that people have bought and traded and sold. So that was, we knew we wanted to do something about that and we were going to this residency that has an incredible letterpress um, and amazing wood type to use and has this beautiful history of printmaking and printmakers coming through the space. And so we wanted to speak to the history of printmaking, the, the act of art making, while we're talking about this more ephemeral um, format of art in, in NFTs. We have a few, yeah, there we go. So um, for, I'll talk a little more about like specific printmaking mediums in a moment, but for folks who aren't aware, letterpress is um, exactly what it sounds like. It is movable wood and lead type that are letters that we are pressing through a relief purpose. And so here is um, the, on my right, I'm assuming it's your right also, um, is large wood type that has been put on a press and then inked up by, uh, that made up the large text for our posters, and then on the left is the lead type um, there. Um, one of the, um, Rebecca had mentioned that like now NFTs have even like kind of fallen out of the zeitgeist, but when we went, not a lot of people were talking about it, and specifically not a lot of people were being openly critical about it, um, especially a lot of my friends who work digitally. Um, they were, they had known other people that had kind of lost clout for speaking out about NFTs. Um, and so we decided that we were just gonna make 400 posters um, as like the most opposite thing that we could do from um, a scarce, completely digital object. We wanted to do something that really had to be tangible and had to be made by hand, um, while also using materials that themselves were hundreds of years old um, with a medium that was meant specifically to make lots and lots of copies with. Yeah, and as part of the process, we used um, different types of printmaking materials. As you can see, this snake carved. Um, and it was just like a very physical, very handmade process. And, and the letterpress itself is kind of an incredible object. It's really old. It broke while we were using it. It takes a lot of physical strength to work. It, you know, the whole process of making these posters was what really, as Zach said, felt like the opposite of digital. Um, in addition to like the amount of time that we were putting into it and what we were getting out of the, the value of what we were getting out of the time was really different than what was happening in the digital world with NFTs where you could mint something really quickly and then immediately make a lot of money off of it. Um, so we wanted to just, you know, even with our process, work with that contrast. Um, with the subject matter. And so with, with uh, actually this is still a good slide to stay on, that like um, we are, there are four posters that t kind of exist within two themes. Um, 
Uh, yeah, totally, yeah. Um, the, the yellow ones um, have, um, are really kind of inspired by Western gold rush snake oil salesman type iconography. And so we're using more of like a cowboy playbill font. Um, and um, that image we had a couple of seconds ago of the linoleum that was carved out of that is carved to look like a snake. Um, Rebecca carved that snake um, to really like literally um, reference the ideas of snake oil salesmen and people selling goods that we know are a scam. Um, and then our green posters, um, and I don't know if we actually like necessarily planned this going into it, it just kind of worked out this way, um, are kind of more referencing current contemporary moments. Um, and so um, the minting is the message, has, an, has imagery of kind of gold bars, um, and then a recycling kind of cycle of, of how it's all kind of, uh, a scam in and of itself, in and of how buying into more NFTs only uh, raises the value of NFTs and of crypto. Um, and that with there, that was really, the minting is the message really a commentary on the idea that um, it didn't really matter, in our opinions, what the images within NFTs were, because most of the time it was the idea of the authentic, authentic certification that people were actually buying. Um, where the post no screenshots was very much Rebecca's brainchild. And, um, I will <laughs> <Yes>. let explain. <laughs> well, and that's, that's a reference to the fact that um, the culture of NFTs dictated that you should not screenshot anything. Because if you screenshot something, then you're like stealing the image. But also the screenshot does not capture the full essence of an NFT because the, the real NFT exists within its authentic coding. Um, and so I don't, if you've ever been in New York or a lot of big cities have you know, the big bills that say post no bills, the bill, big posters say post no bills on um, construction sites. So that was a reference to that. And the um, chain link fence around sort of gatekeeping and keep, keeping people out where the post no bills is keeping out graffiti artists and other types of people who want to interact up with that space. We were sort of commenting that the NFT craze was gatekeeping as well and keeping people out of the process that is pretty complicated and uh, technically heavy to do. So as you can see, you know, we, these are all sort of puns that we came up with um, that reference the language of these other moments in history. And the thing that tied them all together was, was, we were, was the text at the bottom, which I guess we don't have a big picture yeah, we of that. Do a big yeah, we should have that. done that. Well, we didn't do but that. if you go across the street, you can read it four times. <laughs> but it's basically about that. You know, this is a this is something that's happening now, but it's not a unique moment. This has happened in history before. There are always people who are trying to sell authenticity to people for a price that may be higher than they are able to pay. And so we were trying to situate the NFT craze in this in this history of sort of snake oil and salesmanship. Yeah, the, our country is like a history of speculation. Yeah. Um, and this is just another part of it. One of the things that really surprised me when you guys first told me about this process, like I was fairly new to what NFTs are and how they're being used. And when I was first doing readings, one of the things I was thinking about was, oh, this could benefit an artist, right? You can create a piece of digital artwork. Um, you could connect it and through these blockchains and then somehow guarantee that every time it is bought or purchased, that money goes back to the artist. So this idea that there's that potential with the artist getting money for their work. Um, and I think that was kind of like my viewpoint before I started diving into these conversations with you both. And I was wondering um, if maybe you could expand a little bit maybe about how that promise isn't necessarily what currently exists or just any criticisms you might have towards that system. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I mean, first off, I would say I do think artists have made money off of NFTs. So I don't think that like no one has, no artist has benefit, benefited from it. And um, there are people who collect them who feel a real attachment to the actual art and have feelings about it. I don't, I don't think that this is a, we're not trying to condemn anyone who's participating in, in this process and certainly not artists because it's hard enough out there for artists to make any money doing anything at all. So um, 
But I think the promise of it is the sort of democratization, and there's a few issues with that. One being that the process of minting is challenging, um, and it is very technical, and so people who have a specific background are more likely to be able to do that process and make that money off of that. Um, the, the direct connection has already been, uh, intermediaries have already entered this process, right? So like, in some ways, you could say this is the same way it was in millions and millions of years ago when somebody drew something on the wall and uh, a friend gave them like two rocks to look at it. And then a gallerist walked into the cave and was like, I'll take one of those rocks to tell everybody else about it. And so galleries and other sorts of intermediaries have already entered the scene and have started like setting up ways for artists to, you know, to spread their work more broadly, to sell their work more broadly, and things like that. So I don't think it's necessarily um, inherent in the format that it's this direct connection between the artist and the buyer. Um, and then finally, I would say, and I'm sure Zach has other things to say about that, there's, uh, there's a speculative aspect to the entire industry, right? Like crypto, as we've seen in the past week, has really crashed, um, in part because it's, it's based on things that aren't real. So there's this potential for a real crash, similar to the gold rush, right? Like, everyone went west to get gold, there's only a little bit of gold, and a lot of people lost their money. Um, and so definitely a similar thing happening in this industry that we wanted to bring attention to. Did I miss anything? Uh, no, I'm uh, fighting. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, the whole time I was thinking, I was like, gosh, having this conversation a year later, I'm like much less angry. That's great. Um, I think one of the big things that we talked about a lot, and a lot of, one of the things that like really was a thing for me was around the entire framing of NFT art, um, where a lot of this was product and commodification, of which, you know, most Jeff Kuhn sculptures are some form of uh, commodified product, but um, that's also participating in a market that isn't really talking about art, it's talking about capital. Um, and so um, a lot of, if we wanted to call a lot of NFTs design or product or, um, you know, similar to the way that like, uh, no, I don't wanna make that comparison. Um, and so the way that it was being framed as capital A art, but was something that was very much being made um, to exist within a market and for speculation and for commodification. Um, and often plenty of times where like, if we take something like bored apes, there was a single ape uh, template that then they just put 35 hats on um, that was very much just trying to churn out product, um, which is, you know, it, I don't know if I agree with what I'm about to say, but like it's in a craft mold, but I don't know if it's necessarily with an art mold. And so a lot of the dialogue around it within the way that it was going to save artists was a lot of the problem I had where like that, that was never what it was. I think there was also another, that reminded me of one other nuance where a lot of people were talking about it as a new format, a, a, like new opportunity for artists to explore this new format. Um, and it, it just isn't a new format, it's just an image or a moving image. It's not like video art is a new format that artists can use to explore. Um, NFTs are, are not. So I think that was also a, a piece of the puzzle that we wanted to unpack. Um, I actually, I have a slide somewhere, but I'm scared to jump forward right now, so I'm going to keep it right here, and you'll see it when it naturally passes. Um, but with the exhibit, with your posters, we ended up asking an arts practice student to create a piece of original artwork, and then to go through the process of minting that and sharing that experience with us. And so she created a beautiful piece of work that's now on display, and it's actually a time lapse of the work. It's a piece of digital art, and then we have it printed out. But then her process of going through also, um, it was interesting because I didn't tell her your guys' view on NFTs before we assigned her to this project. But her kind of takeaway was she felt like it cheapened her work. Like she recognized this was my artwork and now it's just entered into this commodification um, zone. And she felt like it took away from that authenticity of what her work was. 
And so I thought that was a astute like, observation of that process. And I think it was just through all of the channels of what it felt like, minting it, switching the currency, and doing all of these things um, through that process. And so one of her um, comments that tied back is like, yes, it has this potential for artists, but how it's being used in the market currently is not for artists. It's for commodification, and it's also for this idea of ownership in a way that does not support what craft and art, by art's sake, in the sense of Western world has distinguished it. Cool. I'll, I'll move forward a little bit. Oh. This, Just, uh, uh, for, this is... Uh, on the left, the press that we were using in like wonderful morning light. And then on the right is one of the, our proof prints. And you can kind of see on top where the text is. Um, that image is a little darker up there than we want. But um, with that, that kind of the, the wheel that's on top of the bed kind of rotates back and forth with the paper to kind of press the ink onto the paper. Not kind of, that's exactly what it's doing. And you have to walk with it. Um, I, I had never used a letter press like this before. Zach definitely had. but. It, my first impressions of using it was just how physical it was. Like, my body hurt after using it for hours and hours, and you have to like walk with it, and take the paper out, walk with it back. It's like a very, um, it could be meditative, but it also is just like a, a, a very like human, tangible experience. Um, one of the things that really excited me about having you guys with this topic, with authenticity, was this angle of printmaking and the fact that you've made prints in so many different ways, and I know we're going to dive into that a little bit more, but I wanted to plant this kind of concept seed of thinking about how our perceptions of technology has changes over time, but how it also then we respond by changing our viewpoints of what authentic is. And so, for example, with you guys turning back and thinking about the traditional printing press, being created in opposition to the NFTs, right? It's this idea that this is a machinery, a printing device that was made to create multiples. At one time, it was very threatening to culture of authenticity. And now with where we're at in culture, we look at something like this, and we see it as very craft space. It's very um, hands-on. It's very much the artist's touch um, with individual details, with carving. And just thinking about this idea with each technological advance, our own cultural perception of the previous technological advances really shift our perspective. So, uh, do you want to continue with that, side? <laughs> yeah, if I could continue with that. That, like, even there, that we want to talk, that, like, you had mentioned that, like, the printing press was a threat to authenticity. But even that, like, the, the soapbox I will get on all, like for the rest of the day is that like authenticity is actually just like a code shift for like for maintaining power. Um, but with this, like the the you know the reason the printing press was a threat and like you know in the Western world we mainly talk about movable type in the printing press creating the first, creating the Bible and being able to spread the Bible so that you could not you did not have to go to the church to read scripture. Um, you could have a personal relationship with Jesus without having to pay the Catholic Church your, your penance. Um, more than just wealthy people could have books, but then even beyond the Bible because of that, books of all forms were out there. And so the massive spread of literacy, of understanding of science, of understanding of everything in our world, suddenly there was a democratization of information. And so no, like, that's sure, it. there were probably a couple people that were sad. There were like less illuminated manuscripts in the world, but that wasn't what they were really upset about. They were upset that they didn't hold the one Bible, the one book that was holding society together. Well, and I think too, you touch on a really good point. When I say as a threat, I'm saying that to art with a capital A, right? Like I'm saying it to this idea that I think historically becomes something, but it doesn't necessarily exist at the time, right? Because Printing itself was a technological advance. Like it created a space for literacy to be shared, for information to be consumed. Like that was its primary purpose in a lot of ways. And it's not until later that we started to think about it in terms of art for art's sake. Um, and yes, I and mean, there's different ways we can kind of break that down, and it contradicts. But just as a general swipe, which you know. Making generalizations is never a good thing, so <laughs> we can move on to. Um, do you want to dive into this? Are you ready? Uh, yeah, we can. So, um, uh, 
I want to just finish my, I, if I could, like, um, yes and your last thought um, of how, if to bring it back to art, not just literature. Yeah. If, we take, if we bring it purely back within a art context, um, all of the Caravaggios that the Catholic Church paid for, and you had to then go to a church to go see these, these images of illustrations of the Bible, like the church owned them. You had to go to the church to do them. So yes, we had the printing press that was creating Bibles and advancing literacy, but we also had Durer and all of his workshops creating very small, very affordable pieces of artwork that were um, being distributed massively so that people could have their own icons, their own altars at home. And so like it, similar to talking about NFTs, art was also the catalyst for discussions about power. Well, and you know, with the Durer comment, I think that's a really interesting one specifically because Durer had unlimited editions, right? You can go to a lot of exhibitions that have Durer's and there are all these etchings, but it's like there's not really a threat for authenticity when we think about a Durer, right? It's like, oh, it's a Durer because we have this acceptance of how his artwork was created within the time it was created. It wasn't about controlling this kind of scarcity with printing. And I think that's also an element that like, we're going to dive into a little bit more thoroughly, of thinking about artist intent and how you can create scarcity with multiplicity. Uh, but from there, um, since um, I don't know how many of you um, are art majors or have ever taken art, an art class. Yes. Um, I like participation. Okay, we got a few. We got a few. Um, and of the few of you, how many of you have taken printmaking classes um, or have done any sort of printmaking? Well, We're down to one. Um, so with that, um, a lot of times when we talk about print, um, it's a very um, broad word that like a lot of times like we think of just like digital prints of, of laser jet prints of the thing none of you have in your house anymore um, and you have to like go to the library to print something um, but with that within the medium of printmaking it's much like drawing uh, where we have graphite but we also have charcoal and we also have watercolor and oil painting, they're all different things. And so with printmaking, I um, wanted to kind of run through a couple of things quickly just based on what is in the show over there to kind of ground you. Um, and so that piece on the left, the minting is the message, is one of Rebecca and I's pieces that, as you saw from that video, is a letterpress print which exists within the family of relief printing, um, which is essentially you're inking up a surface that with pressure you are then pulling the print off of that. Where the piece on the right, this Kandinsky piece, is a wood cut and so actually had to be physically carved with the wood. So similar to like drawing with sharp tools on wood. Um, but then that piece of wood can be inked infinite times to then be run through the press to pull the image back off of it. Um, and um, do you want to talk about, do you want me to talk about the provenance of the Kandinsky there? Or, um, yeah, um, actually, let me dive into that, because mm -hmm. that's actually kind of fascinating. How I mentioned with the exhibit, like, we have all these individual case studies, and this is a really good one when we think about in terms of, like, artist intent and how images are used. So this Kandinsky was actually a part of a page of a publication that was published in 1812 called Flang, which means sounds. Um, it was a book publication. Initially, he had created these woodblock block prints. A few of them were exhibited and displayed in a show. And then he really wanted to publish this as a part of that complete body of work um, as a book. And so his first publisher turned him down, and then he finally got this publisher to agree. Um, so there's actually poems initially next to the work. And so when we think about it now, it's separated from that actual space of how the artist intended it to be used but then also then within a book format. Um, after two years, the book did not sell well. The publisher, I think it was a limited edition, like maybe 120 copies of this book were made. And then it was like no publication. Then it reoccurs a little bit later and printed, um, I wanna say in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but this idea then when it's printed again, um, different publisher, how do we define authenticity then in terms of is the artist aware of this? Like, so then it really opens kind of up this gray area of how reproduction is made. And, you know, being in a museum, you get these objects, you can't say for certain where this object comes from in terms of the printing editions, right? Um, you could go through a lot of different tests to find out, and oftentimes there's not the funds to support those tests to find out. And so that's really where that research and diving into these questions get really interesting and exciting. 
Yeah, and I think with Relief Print and this Kandinsky is a great example of like, it has been carved, the piece of wood exists. You can ink it and print it forever. Um, and so a lot of times, a lot of artists will actually like X, like carve X's into their dead blocks once they have completed an edition um, so that you can't find it and reprint it. Um, yeah. Well, and that's a really good um, comparison. Um, well, the next few slides, I have the Warhol's on it. Well, yeah, so, well, no, no, the, I mean, the war, fall, the war, like, everything, like, the next few actually are a perfect example, uh. where, um, with screen printing, screen printing and Rezograph, this very ridiculous poster that we made of sheep or, uh, um, You have extras if you need one for your personal collection. <laughs> Warhol's pieces, like they're typically like very large and in galleries and shown next to paintings, um, but they are usually done with screen print, much as the piece over in the museum across the street is, which is a stencil-based system, um, which is um, exactly also how all of your T-shirts are made, um, where you are using light to expose a stencil that you're then pushing ink through. Um, but as opposed to those wood blocks that you've carved, you spray a chemical on it and the emulsion goes away and that image is gone forever unless you remake that screen. Um, the Rezo poster um, that was the um, how we made the poster for this show, if you want to jump to the next screen, um, is made with a process called Rezograph, which is what most of my studio does, that is also a stencil-based system, but it's semi-automated, um, and the, the machine cuts a stencil, which you may or may not be able to see um, the sheen on those two drums, um, that it has the stencil, and that's actually one of Rebecca's pieces, that is uh, uh, one of ti Rebecca's tiny clay, is the piece there. Um, and with that, you are making the original artwork that you're then sending to the machine to make the stencil, but then the machine actually feeds the, the piece of paper through, but you're still printing everything one color at a time. So a four color print needs to happen four times. But with this, once you've made, once you've made all the prints on that yellow drum, when you go to make the next yellow drum, it's ripped off that stencil, and in theory does not exist anymore, so it can't be remade. Um, different from those relief prints. Interesting. So I didn't realize that like it destroys it in the process. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. So stencil-based so printing like almost a, always it's is like a, a built-in scarcity to the actual printing technique. Yeah, you could continue oh, much like screen brilliant. printing. You could continually make the stencil. Okay. Um, but it's a reusing process, yeah. right? The intention is reu reusing the materials, um, but the result is scarcity. <laughs> this is what happens when you study art history, but you don't actually take any of the art making classes. There's like abstract concepts that slowly come together throughout your maturing years. Okay. Uh, where this piece is, um, and you might be able to speak to the to this one a little better than me, but this is this is a digital print, so it is similar to your color inkjet print at home, um, except it's a very very nice version of that. Um, and it is based off of an actual painting and the way that this artist sells their works is they, they make the painting and then make, I think it's like an edition of five of these digital yeah, prints. So and so- the, Well, the thing is what I recognize as well and oftentimes, and this ties into this idea of artist intent, right? It's like the artist is in control over how many of these works are made. And this is where, that's when we dive into what the difference between forgery or fake is. Um, so the artist is in control, and with something like this, the artist actually, you have a limited set, so like 525, with the idea that you just make them as you sell them. So sometimes they're not even made um, until someone purchases them. So just because it's going to be out of 5 or 25 doesn't mean that that many exist in the world. There could be less. Um, and then the idea is that once it gets, if it does get to that limited number, then the print, the um, mold is destroyed. And it can't be used again. Yeah, so this, is a, this version is also a complicated issue because um, this is printed on an extremely nice, extremely large printer um, by still master printers, but it is very similar in process to you hitting print on a color printer um, to really over generalize. <laughs> and then just two other prints that are also in the show that are, that are worth mentioning, they're different type of print mediums, is the piece on the left is a photogravure, which is a family of printmaking process called intaglio, where you are 
etching into a plate that then the ink lives in. And when you're making prints, you actually suck the ink out of it. Um, and then with those, they do exist in a similar place to the woodcuts where those plates could be around forever um, and you could re-ink them, but you could also burnish them out and reuse the plates. Um, where uh, lithography on the far right, the Toulouse-Lautrec pieces, those are a process called lithography, um, and they were almost certainly stone lithography, um, which is really similar to letterpress, that it was originally an industrial, um, an industrial process. Like Milton Bradley, who we know from game design, from like printing games and being a game company, was actually a lithographer, um, and then printed the original boards of Monopoly as stone lithography, which is totally insane. Um, but with that, you have a stone that you are drawing onto, which is also etching into, and it's a similar ink process. But with that, you reuse the stone every single time in a way similar to, uh, to stencil-based printing, where you can kind of erase the work you've made. Um, to then make another piece. Well, and what's really interesting about the track as well is he was known for creating specific types of printing. And so like even within this one's a good example, you probably can't see it, but it's good to see it. Um, but he did this technique called cross. Um, he actually wrote his mom a letter about it when he invented it because he was super excited. He's like, I came up with the best technique ever. Um, and essentially it was like this splatter effect. Um, through the lithography, and at this point, they had just created lithography, I believe, with like six different um, color options, and so he did a lot of experimentation and um, ways of working with lithography that hadn't been done before. Um, one comment I do want to make about the photo grabber, I'm, promise, I'm saying that wrong, it's what happens when you only read words and you never say them out loud. Um, what is really overwhelming about it, I think, is the fact that it was done with both photographs and with paintings. Um, and so it does kind of have this crossover in its beginning with photography. And so whenever you go to a museum or if you look at these things, you're going to see photographs and both paintings that were made into etchings. And so it's kind of this like, oh, what am I actually looking at? Because it's like that crossover effect. Um, the intention of these initially, especially with this one, which is um, from California Picturesque, but these were published for these really big, beautiful books that were being distributed across America at the time to really glorify the West, right? Beautiful, picturesque California. There was a larger one um, that was done about picturesque America. Um, and then they would do special um, editions, like in color and stuff. So that way, you, when you would have someone over to your Victorian parlor, you could bring out your beautiful books and display them and share about the beautiful landscape. Because at this time, there wasn't much access and a lot of people hadn't seen it. And so it became a way to really kind of share that experience. Um, so um, this was the quote I was looking at for before when I mentioned the NFT with Keishan. Um, just speaking to how she really kind of felt like it took away from, um, I felt like the value of my artwork did, diminishing through the NFT. So here's another quote, <laughs> just going to trickle them throughout. Um, we never look at just one thing. We are always looking at the relationship between things and ourselves. And you guys just keep that in the back pocket of your mind um, because we're going to shift and talk about the aura. I'm going to just fast forward my notes real quick. Very sneakily, you'll never know what happened. Um, so this definition of the aura, um, a quality integral to an artwork's uniqueness and, and presence in time and space. The actual definition that I pulled from the Tate Museum, because I know it's going to make Zach really angry, um, so it is from the Tate. Um, aura is a quality integral to an artwork that cannot be communicated through mechanical reproduction techniques, such as photography. Um, this um, term, Walter Benjamin, in his essay, um, essentially looking at that uniqueness in a place of art and where it happens. And so one of the examples they use are religious icons, right? So if you go to a church and you see these beautiful icons, you go on a pilgrimage to be with this object. Now you can take a picture of it. You can have it in your home, surrounded by your carpet and your cat and your kid crying over here. And now it becomes something that's integrated into your personal life. And he's basically saying that aura of the original object no longer exists. But with that, 
you have this fragmentation, right? And so now this object has been seen in all these different places, and it almost creates this other value for that initial object. I think the Mona Lisa is a really good example of this because it's been reproduced so many times. It has this like inflated value in our culture, and then you go see it in its actual place. And I think for most people, for me, I, I'll speak for myself. It was kind of a letdown. You're kind of like, oh, this is it. Um, because it's been so inflated through its reproduction and how you see it in these different places when you play with it in game cards um, or have it on your coffee mug, right? You have, this, you have a different relationship with the image and then you go and you see it in places that the aura is supposed to be real and sacred like in a museum and when it's just not. Um, anyways, so I do think there is something really fascinating about this concept of the aura through multiplicity and duplicity. And this concept, can you have an aura exist through a reproduction? And I'm curious kind of what you, your guys' thoughts are about that. I mean, this guy isn't alive anymore, so we can like <laughs> tear apart that theory all we want. We can start. I mean, I think it's a question, you know, the aura is a, is a real question for art. Yeah, sorry. It's our, it's our image. I think it's I think it's a question of it what is it where does the aura come from? Does the aura come from the artist's hand? Does the aura come from the artist's intent? Is it, you know, what is it that we're trying to capture and that can't be separated out from the artwork? And I think that's a hard I think it can be a very exclusive and elitist way to look at art, is to say like only something that has been touched by the magic of the artist counts as art. Um, but I think it also speaks to something that feels true, right? Like you went to see the Mona Lisa. The reason you went to see the Mona Lisa, even though you've seen a million pictures of it, is because it feels like there's something special about the one that was touched by the artist. So I do think there's still truth to that idea. And I think, you know, with NFT art, some criticism that I don't know that I necessarily agree with, but there has been some criticism of it that it is cold, you know, it's like a cold medium, it hasn't been touched by the artist, it, it doesn't have the actual aura of the artist, and that means that it's not art. I don't necessarily agree with that critique of it, but I think it's an interesting way of, of looking at, at the, the, the different ways people think about different types of image making and how it relates to authenticity. Well, it's also fascinating too, right? Because we think about, he, he was very dated in his time, right? 1936, he's thinking about mass production, industrialization, um, really film taking off for the first time. The fact that like in Nazi Germany, we have new film reels, right? Like he's really looking at it from this political angle of what it looks like when you have mass images distributed and how that impacts our sense of reality and space. And so I'm also curious too, is like, we've gone to the next step, right? We're like in the digital era. So we're like beyond this whole element of just mechanical reproduction, which now I almost feel like has like a nostalgic yeah. feeling to it. Um, when you say like the coldness of NFTs, and I think that's very reflective of this idea with digital art um, and digital spaces and mediums. There is this kind of coldness that isn't embraced even in the same way that mechanical printmaking is. Yeah, I actually wonder if a lot of what Benjamin was talking about was actually more of a threat to film and photography and a form of documentation versus most forms of printmaking that are like, you know, like our poster is not a reproduction. The thing is the thing. Um, and that is its original existence. Mm -hmm. um, I could take that to a color copier and make reproductions mm -hmm. of that, but this, from its get-go is not. Um, and that for the most part, with most printmaking techniques, copying something mm -hmm. like isn't quite as doable. Um, I'm gonna let this be our transition to this one because I, <laughs> it's just a natural transition. Yes. Um, and one of that, because you mentioned with, like he's talking about film, and one of the elements we explore in our exhibit is like the Polaroid and how it's a very unique type of film in the sense where there's only one original. Um, there's no other type of film where you can have just one. Um, but I was wondering if either of you want to speak to our current slide of what's happening here and how maybe that connects. Well, um, does 
anyone know what an aura photograph is? Raise your hand. No. These Not are even the art majors. Bummer. So <laughs> it is a, a very like woo-woo idea um, that you can have a certain type of camera and if you take a photograph, a Polaroid specifically, of a person with this certain kind of camera, what you will make is this image of the aura. So you'll capture not just the image of the person, but the image of the aura around the person that is unique to that person and unique to that moment and like can only be produced in that instant on that Polaroid. Um, and so it is like a very... It's like a moon ring of yes. um, <laughs> Polaroids. Yes, which is a strange, which is like a very strange concept, but I think really like almost literalizes this idea of the aura. Um, and so, like, that sheep is having its aura taken in the Polaroid, but is that aura any less real than the aura of one of uh, the subjects of Andy Warhol's Polaroids, you know? So, like, that's the comparison we were making with our poster, but I think that's also sort of like a dramatization of the discussion that we're having. It's also a, like, joke on the cloned sheep and so that is also named Dolly, much like the AI art that we're gonna talk about in a minute here. And so like, theoretically, we have three sheep that are clones and are fake and don't have an aura, but this one sheep does have an aura. Thank you for finding that funny. <laughs> Rebecca and I thought we were the most hilarious people in the world when we came up with this poster. Very nerdy. Uh, like I said, there's copies, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're right they're originals. Yeah. They They're are original, authentic artworks. Um, sorry, we are, last stop of the day, um, we're gonna touch briefly on a, um, AI art. And why I chose this slide in particular, for example, is um, we did have one of our students, um, Kat, um, back here. She wrote a beautiful blog post, and if you click on the QR code, it will go to it. But basically, her exploration of exploring Dolly as a platform with AI art, um, this was a work she actually created by using the algorithms and typing in. So essentially, you type in like a description of what something is, and the computer generates it. And so she had typed in a description of one of Zach and Rebecca's posters, um, and this was the generated image that came up. But uh, Rebecca, I'm kind of curious about some of your thoughts and viewpoints on AI art. Yeah, I think AI art is really interesting. I think. Um, I think part of the reason I think it's so interesting is because it is actually a format. It is like a new um, form of art that isn't necessarily commoditized yet. So I think it's, it's interesting because it's new and changing all the time. The algorithms that are out there in order to generate this kind of art are being improved all the time, being fed more and more of the world in order to know more about the world, being able to give more of the world. I also think the way that people create it is really interesting. Um, if you think about it like kind of a Google search where you think about the best combination of words to yield what you want. And so you could say pointillist view of Marilyn Monroe in communist Russia and they, you know, the algorithm would, would pull from all of the images that it's ever seen and then create this thing. So basically you have created art with words and then the algorithm, you know, obeyed you and created some work. And then there's a process of refinement that I think is really interesting too that people go through where if it doesn't quite, very much like a Google search, if you're not quite getting your results, then you try a different combination of words until it gets it. So in some ways it's like coaxing out the answer that you're looking for from this like genie in the bottle of the algorithm. So I think there's some really interesting stuff going on with it. There's also a lot of debate around it as to whether it's real art, as to whether it's ethical to be pulling imagery from real artists whose images are out there in the public sphere for various reasons. And what, and also like for what, the ethics of how this art is being used is it being used to replace the work of professional illustrators, professional artists, um, or is it you know, a novelty? So I think there's definitely a lot of ethical questions that have come up that are inherent to the form and the technology, not necessarily yet the way that it's been commoditized, although that is definitely coming 
soon. <laughs> yeah, like, like uh, why is Microsoft also dumping a ton of money into like pigment experimentation? No, but they are dumping a ton of money into AI. And um, we still have these companies that yes, are offering everything for free are still being like val valued within the market for we're worth billions of dollars. And like to go back like golden inks and paints, like they're not worth billions of dollars. They're probably worth thousands of dollars. Um, and that is like one of the largest paint producers in the world. And so like, I'm suspicious of like, if this is art, like why are multinational corporations, the people who are um, dumping the money into it? Like there's something to be suspicious of there. Um, but then also there are, like we don't learn anything where like, originally deviant art, which like, I don't know if people still like know or care about deviant art, we got a couple people who recognize it. Like they wrote into their terms of service that everyone's artwork was automatically being included into like AR refinement, AI refinement, refinement tools, and you had to opt out of it. And it was only after an outrage that all of this art that has existed on this website for 20 years, uh, that 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 was hidden in there that they decided to change course and you actually could opt in to making it something that was helping to build these tools. And so like even from art platforms, there's something nefarious happening. Um, and that's something to be concerned about. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so I do want to be mindful of our time and I already went 10 minutes over what I was going to say for the Q&A, so I apologize everyone. But we're gonna do a casual transition now. <laughs> so this is the time if you have any questions for Zach or Rebecca, anything that you're curious about today. Or comments. Yeah, you can ask me a question yeah. to you. But you can also just be like, you're, times, I disagree so. completely. <laughs> I'm fine with that. I support that, actually. It's going to keep shifting. 
I think I actually want to make the argument that uh, aura is the value of the public and authenticity is the value of the market. Uh, and uh, like because like if we go back to the icons like you know when I was in Greece a few years ago like I bought like a icon reproduction that like there is a church that the that the monks are who are screen printing all these icons and like yeah it's a replica of one that's in there but it's like a physical thing that was screen printed by some dudes um, and I love this thing and I spent ten dollars on um, and I absolutely love this object and it holds that thing to me and it, it, it provides a gateway to an object um, even if it has like no authentic value it's got an aura and a spirit to it completely um, and so like when we're talking about like the reason we run to the Mona Lisa is because of uh, the hype like and the aura that is around it is completely created by culture um, and the authenticity of it like whatever like though we're not buying it we don't care about that like uh, I would argue we don't like truly emotionally care about that um, individual yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. So can I actually switch that to the aura that can be manipulated by market? So then that's the culture side versus the authenticity is your relationship with that piece that you got in Greece. So it's the same idea as far as then the program's going, and then that's that authenticity that they're waiting to grab onto when they actually are in the presence of what they think I want to address the first, your first question, and which is also on a, a kind of response to your question, where um, uh, I want to say that I don't know if you can uh, remove uh, like authenticity from 
the market because uh, like to take it back to like my stance, not to say yours was wrong, of aura being from the people and authenticity being from the market, is that um, your average person, I can't go figure out if that Da Vinci that the Crown Prince bought for money laundering purposes was real or not. You, like only institutions and people with power can actually pursue authenticity. And so I would argue that authenticity is is the tool of the powerful because they have the ability to to discern that. Where your average dumb dumb buying an icon from a guy on the street in Greece, like cool, I loved it. That was great. You could have told me it was 100 years old. I don't care. I still love it. And like, and I couldn't figure out if it was real or not. Anyways, even the story of those monks at the church and over there screen printing it—that could totally be a lie. Um, but I'm fine with that. Um, and so I think that that's kind of where I would respond to that answer. Um, as for the printmaking question, um, I, I personally, especially when working with Rizzo, um, I think about the, this is the art, mainly because the pro, since the process is one color at a time, and one of the things that I actually kind of like with working with Rizzo, and even to letterpress to a lesser extent, since it is a collaboration with a machine, there is a certain amount that, that there's a certain amount of unpredictability that the end, I, I don't know the end result until it's made. And so that, that final process works there. I think we're talking about something like an etching or a woodcut. You could go either way. Um, I'm not as romantic about those mediums. I think like a mezzo tint, like, which like two people know what a mezzotint is. You literally rock like a plate forever and it's the most masochistic thing in the world just for you then to go smooth it back out and the print just looks like any other print. Um, I would say something like that. The plate is the piece, but this is me. But it's also the artist's intent, right? The artist intends with printmaking for the, for the work to be the print. And so if, if, if we are to believe that authenticity has any relationship to the artist's intent, then I would say that the, the print is the, is the work of art. If, if we're going to say, no, what we actually care about is like fingerprints of the artist as a, you know, this is a historical document, then, then maybe the, the wood block should, should not be X'd out for all of history. <laughs> No rough question, just sort of <laughs> roundabout musings. 
Yeah, also if it's not clear, we want artists to make money. Yeah. We, <laughs> we like money. Uh, we are not, I mean, I do wish we like lift and lift and just like a cool barter economy, but we don't. And so while we are in this world, I want artists to have money. So I want to make sure it's clear that that wasn't, yeah. that wasn't said. We don't want you to die to get money. Yeah. Yeah. Your yeah. estate yeah. to get money. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think my my answer to that is um, to uh, be anti hierarchical in the way that you approach and consider art, and that um, yeah, what's in the museum like has like what's at the SF MoMA is historically important but also three floors of the SF MoMA are a tax shelter for the Fishers. Um, and so like, even just in that nature, that is not like an altruistic thing for that to exist in a museum and recognize those power structures are there and recognize if all of the galleries that are right in Oakland. Um, and that uh, realizing that like the art world is um, like very huge and that I think the way to democratize art is to um, change your relationship to it like as a viewer and recognizing that it is everywhere and it can't be everywhere and that um, I think that yeah that's the beginning of my thought but it can't have an aura everywhere <laughs> <laughs> uh, well no so that's what I'm saying is, is it totally can um, something like the like the East Bay print sale, for anybody who is here and um, is remotely into print work and you all live in the East Bay or at least reside in the East Bay on a regular basis, that is like, in my opinion, the premier printmaking event of the Bay Area every year. And it's three days in a kind of grungy garage where the, in a studio that they've cleared off every table and it's like a flea market. It's just mountains of prints that you go and you dig through. Nobody's there selling it. Um, we've all written in pencil on the back of this thing, like what it's gonna cost. And like there is work that's five dollars and there's work that's hundreds of dollars and it's all there in a pile and you just have to wait in line usually on a rainy Friday um, to then go dig through this. And what I really love about that that event specifically is that it's there are students that have made a couple of prints that are there and are selling for five dollars and there's also plenty of artists that are in museums and in institutions and in collections all in the same pile um, and you just like have to go to find it. Um, I think that we can't trust institutions to be the ones that are democratizing because it's not in their power interest. Yeah, I think, I think it's worth saying that it would be, there are places in the world where access to art is more of a cultural value and, and it is more democratized to an extent and, and art is more integrated in a way that it's not here and maybe less hierarchical in some ways and maybe more hierarchical in other ways and that's not our culture today and it would be, it would take political and financial sh major shifts for that to happen but I do think it's important to recognize that that would be great if that happened and that's not the responsibility of the people in this room but the, thing, the things that the people in this room can do can enhance our own relationships with art. 
also love museums. I'm members of lots of museums. Um, <laughs> they are systems for power, but they are, I'm also glad they exist, uh, even to most of the bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Zach and Rebecca, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.